Hello, fellow teens. Uh, today we have the legend himself, John Feldman, in our studio slash office. And we have LA Emo Night tomorrow, New York Webster Hall on Thursday, and Dallas on Saturday. Anyway, enjoy it. It was really, really fucking cool having uh, John Feldman here. So, bye. You are now listening to the Ride or Cry podcast. So far, this is going so good. It's really yeah. good. It's, it's awesome. very, it's really, really now. good. Yeah. You, are you hi. good? I'm good, dude. Okay. Hi. Should we just do this thing? Hey, welcome to uh, Writer Cry Podcast. Uh, this is a different one because we have two new people on it. Uh, well, three new people. Uh, you're not in the cartoon. I'm not. I didn't even know there was a cartoon. We did a cartoon. <laughs> uh, we have John Feldman. Hi. Uh, good That's, morning. That is very cool. We and Jacob and Skins and it's me. Um, so this is our third one. We did radio for a year, like two years before we started to do our podcast. Ooh. And so I used to go to the Valley every Friday and it was a nightmare and it took all day. And so we just decided to start doing these here and having people come here. So we do less. Good. Yeah, right? I, I get it. I, I work at home. I don't go anywhere. So, so does I do. Well, I used to. Yeah. And now then I moved my studio to a spot in Atwater. So what we cabin fever is a real thing. And I was, oh man, it was so bad. I was bogged down. I, should, no, I got I three know. waters, dude. I'm Take taking them off. We need you well hydrated. <laughs> I'm down here. I got it's this like and a, I have tea. A wiener and two water balls. Yeah. Exactly. Sort of, isn't it? It's awesome. Yeah. It's like a fucking spaceship. It is. It's massive. <laughs> I feel like I'd be way worse at explaining who you are than you are. I was thinking, um, by the way, just to talk about who I am. Yeah, do that. Uh, <laughs> how, you know, I was in the valley just now. I live in the valley. Yeah. And you don't even really notice you're not in the valley coming to your place here. Where'd you, which, what, what way did you go I live down? in Calabasas and then I stopped for a little meeting in um, Valley Village. Wow. Which is definitely the valley. It's yes. like Van Nuys Valley. It has the word. And then all of a it. sudden, I was here. I just had my navigation on, and I was here. And I'm not in the valley, but I didn't notice. Usually, there's like a a hill, a definitive. Thing. Yeah, it's like Laurel Canyon or whatever, or the 405. You're yeah. going over the hill, and you know you're not in the valley. Now I don't. I, I still. It's still hot. It's windy. I'm still. It feels like I'm in the valley, but I'm not in the valley. No, this yeah. is cool. I the, we, the reason why we got this office is because my apartment is literally what, like a two minute. I, if I ran, if I ran as fast as I could, let's not overdo it. You've never ran in your life. Eh. <laughs> if I ran as fast as I could, I'd get here in under 30 seconds. Wow. So that's why we like this spot. But yeah, no, I know we lived in the valley. Okay, how about this? Who are you? Um, I love the Jesus. I'll, I will. T- I, I'm John. John. Hi, yeah, <laughs> hi my John. name is John. Yeah. And, uh, I like the Cheetos in your room here. It's yeah. rad. Um, but I was just gonna say I like to just before I forget because my mind is dude. It's like a ham a hamster on no Ritalin ever. Um, it's just like on, on like meth or something. It's yeah, well, forever going. And yeah. so Jesus saves. I love that about your building, that it's just so rad, LA. I've been here since Dude, a long time, forever. So, and it's the best. So, speaking of, of that, we actually may take that building. Killer. And keep that up there. Yeah. Because this is like Emo Night. Like, this is. So, Emo Night is, is. This is Emo Night Rider Cry offices. So, Emo Night is the. The night that we do, that you're gonna do, right? I'm gonna do. Fuck yeah! I got my playlist already. Great. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I'm very I'm pumped thinking, about that. I'm thinking. I'm not, I've been thinking about doing and that. I'm excited. It's that re- means I'm excited. Have you been there? I have not, dude. I have children. How, of course, I haven't been. Well, I don't know. I'm 49. Well, no, no. So like when? What would I do at fucking emo night? I mean, I I love. <laughs> I love the idea. I mean, I hop is my homie, and he tells he's, me, he's he got the kids. Time he loves it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited. Did yeah. He t- did he? Was he like, watch out for that Morgan guy? No. Okay. He just said he has the best time every All time right. he goes, and he kind of gave me a little lowdown of sort of. I was like, all right, I've never done. I'm not a fucking DJ. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Was, well, great. So, you want to know? What's neither great? was he when the first time he showed up. He actually bought decks and everything to practice with he before he showed up. The whole story. It's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, what's great is neither are we. We just know yeah. how to use uh, <laughs> Spotify pretty well. Okay. So that's really kind of all you need. But. um Anyway, I 
I think that this is so we've had 303 in here we had neck deep and now you okay and so I feel like we're just per- progressively so going standard. downward yeah, yeah. <laughs> downward into lesser known <laughs> yeah. less famous uh, so this is actually very 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 cool for us um, you are you are, are, are is Goldfinger still a thing yeah of course yes yeah right. I don't actually, know I gotta no, until I, saw, I die it will I be saw a thing. You great. I was at That's the right. chain reaction show two years ago I actually like met you kind of backstage real briefly through Jeff Funk who we both know. Yeah, uh, I don't know who that yeah, is. I know, I know. But he, I think he used to do like social stuff for you, but you guys no doubt blink, like he does it for okay. everyone. Uh, he's a real squirrely looking dude, but he's on the vegan train. Okay, and, like, great. But anyways, it was when uh, Brandon from, uh, Brandon Steinkert played <laughs> drums with you guys. Okay, and was that a benefit show? <sighs> that you know, I, yeah, okay. That I don't Chain Reaction, what made, did that's like 10 years ago. No, that was like real, like Brandon from the used, Filled in with you guys. Yeah, yeah. He's he played a bunch. He's played a lot with oh. us. But I mean, Chain Reaction. I remember playing there for a long, long time. Man, I don't. Th- I don't feel like it. It definitely wasn't ten years. Are you going to argue maybe it was with like, him? Yes, I'm let's, let's argue, fight about right? it. What's the um, so uh, I, the drive through records did a thing. That's when I played there. It was like a benefit show for some band that like had their van oh got destroyed. Whatever. Anyway, that was a fun show. That place uh, it, is rad. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. So the what Good what's show. really cool is that like I remember. That there was a time there was a time in my life where hang ups was the only thing that I listened to. So to be sitting here and do it and doing this, it's a really weird, like full circle of things. This is very, very cool for I think for all of us because these two like Jacob works with Ryder Cry, he's in my band and he's a producer. So like what we did yeah. was we decided to I don't I don't know much about it, like produ- production. I don't know much about you know any of that side of stuff so I, we figured we're like let's bring in the people that actually do know things about what because if it was just me and you i would just tell you shitty stories about me and make it you know and so i figured we could open up the floor because i feel like you have some questions about that are at least interesting for some people that would want to know about production stuff well, some you, bullet points yeah some bullet points and like you know, there's some things that I want to ask too, especially about the new new Blink thing, you know, and all the stuff that you've done. So, I mean, that that's really this is a really cool thing for us to do. So, I, we really appreciate you being here. And what do you got going on? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess we could start with Goldfinger and those days and like the Tony Hawk One soundtrack and like how like that's really well for us and for this company and everything. Uh, like this, what seeded the nostalgia of I guess this whole genre that we call pop punk ska emo everything this stuff it's uh, all inclusive now it's is really it really is like it's all just one it was all one movement and we didn't know it at the time i guess that's how it always but but, but yeah uh goldfinger playing all the shows and then transitioning into doing production stuff which made you transition into a and ring for warner and maverick and then like finding the used and like when you heard that stuff for the first time let's i guess let's start there uh, yeah, dude, there's a lot. It's a lot of stuff for sure. And sometimes I forget that I've lived dude. because, you know, you, you go every day and you do your life and you're in it and you just kind of forget sometimes. But there is, like Steve Jobs says, you can only really connect the dots looking backwards. No one has a crystal ball to see kind of what the future holds. And I can only see how I've got here to you guys to talk about some of this stuff. It all ends here. This yeah. is it. This yeah, is the this end. Is You've locked this the door. Like, I can tell by the no, Paps Blue the Ribbon tw- 24 pack. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, dude. Like our like our stand. I haven't like, drank in a like long a, time. That'd be a whole fucking different interview. Yeah. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> that would Same. be terrible. Yeah. Uh, terrible life for my family and anyone who comes near me. Anyway, I, I know that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he kicked me out. I did. Yeah. Fucking Mexico. <laughs> we'd be in Mexico so quick. I'd have my pants off within fucking three seconds. <laughs> uh, just I see naked. that we do the same thing. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. Great. <laughs> <laughs> just us. Wait, what, what is really it about drug company. people that just make them want to go to Mexico and get naked? He you, did the, the literal same thing. Yeah. yeah. Every, <laughs> time, <laughs> dude, every time I've been to Mexico, they're like, every like when I did drink, they're like every time I walked it. So, <laughs> you did you drink in Mexico? Like, I drank you, most okay, of so, my career, drinking. Great. Career so just, so in Mexico, right? So what they did. Yeah. This is how they got us. So in high school, we, me and Jacob, uh, grew up together in Tucson. And Tucson is like you know you could do like an like a. It's where you learn how to drink. Yeah, I've learned that. You grew up in Tucson. Yeah, I've yeah. I've actually realized that more living here and drinking far more than I ever did in Tucson is that 
I actually learned how to drink like an idiot living in a city like that. Uh huh. Because it's just like a college town. Yeah. Right? Like people just people can afford to drink like five seven nights a week yeah. and still have like jobs and go work at like a market and like make money and pay two hundred dollars a month for rent. Tell the Mexico so the way they got me <laughs> was we went to like during the week during the weekends, like on Fridays and Saturdays, we'd be like, Alright, let's go to Nogales. And like that's like a Nogi. Nogi is like a forty five minute drive. Okay. Right? So and you can drink there when you're eighteen and plus they also don't care. Yeah. Um so what what happened was they were like when we would go down there and they would fill up plastic cups full of like a hundred percent alcohol and put a plastic straw in it. <laughs> yeah. And they'd be like, Here you go. And then they'd light it on fire. Yeah. So Jeez. if you didn't drink it like in time, your shit would melt and you would be embarrassed in front of all your of friends. Of course. So the way that they got you and then all of a sudden <laughs> that happened and then all of a sudden you are in jail. And so like that happened every single time that I went to Mexico. I would just find like, and and therefore that's why I don't drink anymore. Yeah. Or go to Mexico. Uh, I, yeah. They're like, every Babs really wants to go. Babs is the other. So TJ, Babs, and I do, do emo night. And he's just Ricky back there. Babs. She, Babs is not here. Oh, not here. She's running a festival. Like, <laughs> Hoppus loves Babs, though. It's called yeah. Fire said, she's Festival. Amazing. She is the best. Okay. She's the best. <laughs> Sorry, uh, he didn't mention you at all, bro. Good. Just her. That, that I'd rather that's not be mentioned thing. than mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's like way better. Yeah. I grew up in the Bay Area. I spent most of my life, you know, kind of all my seminal years discovering music in the San Francisco area. So I saw so many great shows. But I moved to San Diego. Uh, right when I graduated high school, when I was 17, and the first weekend I was there, my roommate that I was moving in with to go to you know community college because I couldn't, I fucking hated, I couldn't deal with school. The worst. I took his car without asking at this epic old school Range Rover. I took it to Mexico the first weekend he was there, and I I went I went with my two other roommates that were in San Diego, and I blacked out. Right, we were we, we were drinking this this whatever, normal Tijuana club. And uh, the guy that was drink, buying his drinks was named El Diablo, right? Of course. Which, whatever, you're yeah. in Mexico. Yeah. And, and I, I came to out of a blackout at a donkey show, which of course is what, you know, what's what you do when you come to in Tijuana out of a blackout, that's where you end up. Sure. Nobody's ever not done that. And I couldn't, find, I couldn't find my one roommate. My other roommate, we ended up making back to the border. My roommate's car had been stolen at the border. We had to um, crawl in this other dude's car from San Diego <laughs> and get back. But my other roommate was missing for two days. His name was Garnugi, right? So he, two days later, Comes home, half his body's completely sunburned. He's in his underwear, lost all his clothes, frothing at the mouth. mouth. And then he tells us a story. He keeps drinking with El Diablo and me and my other roommate bail. And El Diablo says, dude, let's go back to my pad. Like three in the morning, everyone's doing meth and coke. Like, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, normal shit that people do when you're 17, I guess. And, sure. Um, just wasted. It gets in this limo. The guy locks the door, takes his wallet and says, and then he's got his buddy with him, this huge bodyguard. He says, if you try and run, I will find you and I will fucking kill you. <laughs> so they drive, you know, probably an hour and a half. Sun's coming up the next morning. Shanty town, like cardboard boxes town. They get out of the car. Wait, there was a limo? He has his limo. El Diablo had a okay. limo. I just need to like a limo. backtrack. Yeah, yeah. there's a yeah. limo. So that's part of the story. They're yeah. going to this place and uh, and they get out of the car. Everyone in the city is bowing down to El Diablo. We'll look him in the eye and my friend's going, fuck, what the hell is happening? They lock him in a room and there's seven other kids that were all 17. So there are seven other like young men that he notices. They have their shirt off. They have hairy, like hair on their chest, but they've got breasts. And so this guy's a doctor. El Diablo's a doctor mm. that's mm -hmm. probably prostituting American <laughs> yeah. boys and getting them like strung out yeah. and lock him in a room and, and he's going, holy shit, I am going to be um, a chick a, a in the hairy, morning. A hairy, a hairy man chick with in the morning. And he escapes by watching the sunset out the window and runs to the border, goes under the border, gets back to my house. This guy, Garnugi, Greg Garcia, this guy I went to high school with, holy lost shit. his mind, became homeless guy, like this, destroyed his life, this experience. Yeah. And it could have been me. They say seconds <laughs> and inches. I, why the fuck? I blacked out. And then I could have been. A chick in, in Mexico. I, I'd be, well, I could be here. Maybe my, I don't know. My band would be a little different sound. Yeah. Who knows Jane, what could have happened. Jane Feldman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then which that's is, respect. Which whatever, but, it, but not by choice. And, it would have been a little gnar. And then that's how oh. Goldfinger started. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> so, that's the beginning of my band. Yeah, exactly. So, I, I, you know that LD? Diablo means the devil. 
That's probably <laughs> really. Um, if I would have known that, dude, maybe I, maybe I would have <laughs> told Garnugi to not drink with him. Just Which is Spanish. Yeah. That sounds scary. Just throwing that out there. Uh, uh, so, yeah. So let's never ever do emo night in uh, in, in, uh, Mexico. in Mexico. El That's Diablo just like dead DJ. set on going, and I'm like, y'all go ahead. I'm gonna stay back here. Every time I've gone to Mexico, I can't. Dude, I've seen done. pictures of Revol- Revolucion. Like the main street's so different. It's all like. Is it awesome now? Yeah, like, it's totally blown. It's not what it used to be. I because I can't think of it's anything. Like the third I, you know, and you're like, now? that's all you. Got. Yeah, it looks like the fucking <laughs> Grove. <laughs> uh, dude, it's so the fucking Dave and Buster's down there now. <laughs> <laughs> there probably is. Yeah, I haven't I, there's got to be. I haven't been forever. I'm not. I haven't been back. I'm like, this is not where I want to be. It's hang. probably like what uh, it is. Very hard. The same. It's probably <laughs> like all kind of like uh, smoke and mirrors for tourism and stuff. But then like you walk a block. Yeah, away. I'm sure. I mean, most of those like cities in in Mexico are like that. It's like you go like to the main strip and then much like Los Angeles here. Yeah. <laughs> It's all nice. You yeah. can keep the donkey it's out of Mexico. You, you just that's right. Keep Mexico out of the. So donkey. whatever happened to <laughs> <Or> whatever? <laughs> did you ever? Did anything ever happen like to El Diablo or? Dude, this guy escaped. This? None of us went back to go yeah. find. Hey, bro, I want my wallet back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, not that, but like, I wonder if. <laughs> hey, I'd actually probably yes. be scared to tell anyone about. This Dude, story. I didn't see yeah. for yeah. for like four cops. weeks yeah. because yeah. the guy had our address. I was like, he came home, he's like, El Diablo has my address. And I'm like, dude. You had to move your whole fucking family. My God. Uh, Dude, I want to talk, let's talk some production stuff or like what's going on with you. uh, Because I could do this all I'm sorry. I went off tangent there. No, no, that was was beautiful. Um, It's literally a, the, I, I like the one thing that I wanted to to bring up is, is about the new Blink album and how you managed to make it sound uh perfect thank you is man. the thing because it was like you know the the albums bef- what, what what you managed to do is like make it sound current and also like blink thank you and yeah. and i think that that was like the most important for thing for blink fans like all of us we were really really like i was i was like i hope this album is good and like everybody in the same like that i know was like fuck we hope this album is good he got a leaked copy of it somehow, and we were like, "This is a ten out of ten album." Bond we were like, "Blast!" Yeah. We're yeah, he got something, but we were like, "We were like, holy shit, they fucking did it! They managed to be a band that was so like that. You you want that? You want them to sound like Blink? Yeah, like fans want want Blink to sound like yeah. Blink, but you also want new songs. Is this yeah. something that like you discuss with them in terms of? I guess like in a situation like that. Like, how do you preserve the integrity of like a band? That's Dude, that's, been that's for such so long? a great question because it's so um, multifaceted. Because Jerry Finn was such a mentor to me when before I was going to be a producer. Like, kind of right. I had, I had produced a band called Show Off from Chicago and a band called Mess that were these kind of like uh, you know unknown pop punk bands that never really did anything. But I wasn't really invested. I was still invested in being in a band and thinking that was going to be my life. But when I found the used, I knew I had I knew I had something that needed to be really taken care of and so I started asking people and Jerry was somehow always around in some studio next door and I just hit him up about bus compressors and about guitar amps and about how to mic a guitar amp and how to do stuff and he was always just like he was that guy and I've met producers now that are so I'm not going to give you my like they, they say like I'm not giving up my whatever your sure, secrets yeah. or some yeah, yeah, shit yeah, it's yeah. like it's not about it's about the song it's about the driver and it's about how you put it together it's not about like your fucking snare sample yeah. or how you mic a guitar that's not going to sell a record dude or not totally. the record sell, but not gonna. Can, can you just say that again to him? Because <laughs> I've been fucking working so hard and telling him that sound. In his, in his in his defense, though, it's all it all matters. In his it, defense, I know it, it all matters, matters. But the reason I'm the reason why fucking people buy albums is because of a song. It's not a sound. The songs, uh, the songs both, are very. I don't, I don't know. Look, I mean, look, I'm not to take. I don't even know who produced the Strokes, but not to take anything away from him. But if you listen to that record, it's kind of. Kind of you know, production-wise, sort of unlistenable, but the songs and the vibe is so great. Yeah, no, that that really speaks to your point that the songs, our song is king, and it always is that way from the history of music, and yeah. even 2017, we're still that. But so it was the long. I mean, dude, I spent a lot of sleepless nights thinking, how could I carry this amazing 
you know, band, this legacy of this band without like the kind of lead singer, a key member. Yeah, sure. And without yeah. their producer, you know, that like and Jerry influenced, I mean, everything, the Alkaline Trio and AFI. And, yeah. Um, everything that Jerry had done, I'd followed him. So I remember pulling over, I, there's an Alkaline Trio song on K-Rock one night. I pulled it over in Westwood like probably 15 years ago. I'm like, what, how did he get it to sound this way? I'm, I was the same exact way. When, I mean, before I even knew what a producer was or anything like that, when I was still listening to stuff, just listen to it. When Enema of the State came out, like that's when I was like, I don't get why this sounds like this. Like what, who did this? Who, what, what was the, the process? And mm -hmm. that's when I found Fenn and like realized like how much stuff he had done and what he was doing and stuff. But anyways, yeah. I had to. But look, I, I grew up in the Bay Area where it was like, um, I, and I've watched so many documentaries on Southern California punk rock because I mean, all my favorite bands when I was a kid, Social Distortion, Agent Orange and Adolescence and Black Flag and everything was like, you know, they were all kind of Orange County, LA bands, Circle Jerks. And every show I went to in the Bay Area, like Dead Kennedys and Avengers and um, it was all like you'd be in the pit but everyone would pick you up as like these peace, peace punk movement in San Francisco it was like so different than what I heard of the black flag like taping razor blades to your combat boots and like slicing <laughs> people at punk rock shows it was so different and so pop punk came along and it became sort of like a, a hybrid of the aggression but it was like a very positive and it felt reminded me of being a kid of being picked up and being supported you know dude I can't wait for you to be at emo night because that is like exactly what it, it sounds like we like we've done oh, so so many of these in the last like two years and I don't think there's been one one fight I mean there have been pits there have been like there have been pits on like the patios of these places <laughs> yeah. like in and, and it's fucking like every but you never see Especially anybody. with alcohol involved it's a like ton of alcohol like mind it's, blown yeah it's, an, it's insane no fights people drink ever and everybody's just really 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 happy to be the genuinely happy to be there and i think it really like I, I something happened within the last like couple of years where um electronic music i i think that fans of electronic music either got jobs or like a younger generation was like we i want to see more rock and roll now i want to hear more rock and roll now or our gen like these guys are like we we want that again and well, so i think there's like a lot of nostalgia involved with like the feeling and i think kind of what you're talking about is like not like not reliving it but like putting yourself back in that moment when you discovered going to a show was like more than just watching a band like rock out and and being part of actual uh, of an actual movement i mean where we grew up in tucson there is this all ages venue called scrappies and it was actually really similar to like chain reaction like youth run a lot of a lot of youth stuff going on during the day but I remember the first time someone took me there. I think I went to The Impossibles. Yeah. Which is like, the yeah. first, like, you know, I mean, this dates me. I'm not that, that old. But uh, going there and just, like, watching people sing along and, like, jump off stage and not get kicked out or, like, thrown out by security. I mean, there was no security. But I think kind of reliving that moment and seeing something like Emo Night do that um, for a lot of people is more than just going to watch a band play. I mean, it's been proven now that you can watch a DJ or listen to a DJ and they just play the hits from, from that era or from the time that you were younger and like you're able to just sing along and go crazy. It's, it's crazy. Cause like you just see that disconnect. Yeah. I don't know. I think that like a lot of the, like we, the, especially right now, like youth is like needing, they need stuff. Like we need stuff. Yeah, and I think that it's really important to like bring bands like Blink back and and bring bands like Goldfinger back. Like I think it's like right now, especially right now, especially with the current like political climate, like uh, we, you know, it's a it's a necessary thing. I'm on it, brother. Don't worry, yeah, I got good. it handled. All um, right, great. Thank but you. I was going to say, solved. like, yeah, the, um, <laughs> ultimately too, singing along is such a uh, it's such an important thing for when I was growing up to be able to have someone that I could say this guy like Mike Ness was my 
I would say the guy that I kind of look to to say maybe that guy has the answers to my problem, my internal struggle with hating my parents and hating school and hating authority and all of it. Like and listening to his like Mommy's Little Monster was my song when I was a kid. And like looking to him to have that. And um, I think like we talk, like we talked about EDM ultimately isn't really a lyric or lyric driven music for the most part. It's just about dancing and kind of letting go, which is, which is great. And I think in this, in this era where you're, where you're very, um, where you're always distracted by everything. I mean, you've got, my son's got like Clash Royale. How old, my, how old are you? Eight and 11. My eight daughter's 11? on uh, Musical.ly, which is the worst fucking app it's of all same, fucking time. Dude, it was, we so, know all about a little it. Si- a little side note. We got signed to like, we, we're in a pop band, uh-huh. and uh, <laughs> which is wild. And a single came out today. But our the label like, congratulations. Right. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, I didn't know we were going to discuss. Yeah, we just we, let's not yeah, do that. Yeah, let's not. But do we it, but. <laughs> essentially what he's driving at is that they're like pushing musically on us, yeah. and we're like, and, and you have to. I mean, Does if you really want to like compete in this is world, that you have to do you that. Have to, it's like anyone from six years old till 13, that's all. They don't go to YouTube or Viva. They just go on music. That's it. Musically is how they just, that's what it is. I literally have That hurts me so my bad. Do, my, none of my kids know what Spotify is. They don't know. It's like it's musically is it. It's like this, like a 10 second snippet is all yeah. just for fucking 10 hours of back of my seat as she's videoing herself <laughs> singing on a Sean Mendez over and over trying to get the video right. No, not good enough. Not good enough in slow motion. So when it plays back, it's, it's fast and she looks like she's shredding and it's just like, and I'm Everyone's driving. Everyone's attention span is this so is, fucking short now with it all is. these like apps. But that's, that's, it's so that's, crazy. that's the point. So I think a lot of times with pop music now where it's so minimalistic, I mean, the theory is that because there's so much distraction and shit going on that people just want their music to be like more in the ambient because it sounds like just elevator music when i was if i would hear the music now i think that's just music i would hear in an elevator sure. totally going shopping at sears with my mom or something right. like, that's what it is starbucks just, playlist stuff exactly yeah you know so for me yeah i think i think that knowing what emo night has done and knowing what my hop has just said this is it's an, he just described this thing as like an incredible event of people coming together, singing the best songs of all times. And even though he didn't write the songs, when he plays them, he feels like he wrote this. That's what Uh-oh. he describes to me. That's it's what it's just, like. You would think you're there at that band show every song. Like yeah. every song, every person singing, and the people on stage are going nuts. Like it's, it's. But even when I had the used open for Goldfinger, it was like... I mean, we you know we we never blew up to as big as Blink or anything, but we were doing like you know whatever two thousand seaters, and every night like I would watch Bird four o'clock in the fucking and and it's just like yeah. before even people knew it like that moment to yeah. want to grasp onto something that you relate to, like for me it's all always been about the lyric and connecting with that, and so that was one of the first convers- to bring it back to the Blink thing. That was one of the first conversations I had with with Hoppus is about what is it going to be because all the demos I had heard. It kind of, it sounded like, um, half of the songs sounded like Alkaline Trio, sure. of the demos they had, and the other half um, kind of sounded, um, kind of sounded blinkish, but it just, um, it wasn't cohesive on any level, and, and so I thought my role in the beginning was really to see how do I make this feel like Blink, because it's Blink, it's not, it can't be Alkaline Trio, who I love Alkaline Trio, right. Right. but it can't be it's that. It's a Blink album. And yeah. you, you know, Skiba <laughs> opens his voice, and you know exactly who it is, totally. yeah. and so we had to, um, we had to really dig deep to figure out what is that because it has to be fucking fun because life is short, right? And and the idea that so many people take themselves so serious these days and, and the political climate that we're in is like no one fucking, you know, it feels like we're getting a little looser the last few months since we got a new president. Sure. It feels like people are like, okay, we got to start fucking yeah. figuring this shit out. Yeah. It was real tense for but, a fucking but Blink, second. But Blink was always the band. Like Blink opened for Goldfinger in 94. Probably You ever bring that up? You when I up. talk to them? Yeah, you ever bring that up? Of yeah. course I did. Yeah. 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 Remember yeah. those tours, bro? But, yeah. but we, had a, we had a drummer that was troublesome, and he never let Travis fucking, he would never strike his kit. And I was right, fucking, right. he'd be so pissed. Dude, do you not understand? Even back then, when he was in the Aqu- when the Aquabats were opening for right. Goldfinger, it was like, this a- guy is one of the greatest drummers ever when he was a kid. Travis yeah. was a kid. Yeah. And I'm like, how can you not strike your kid for this legend? Right. It's terrible. Dude, I remember we saw Aquabats in uh, Tucson. They made everybody sit down. Classic. Yeah, they made everybody sit down. It was like the first time I've ever, I've, I ever saw that. They're like, all right, guys, now everybody just t- take a seat. That dude, Christian, 
is so gnarly, dude. He did his, he's there, he's Mormon, right? Grew up in Utah and did his mission in Japan. Wow. Learned Japanese and went door to door preaching Mormonism to Japanese people <laughs> in Japanese. Yeah, that's it. That's what? how gnarly that guy is. It looks is. like he just like took a, th- like a fucking bunch of, he like, Threw a dart and he's like, "All right, that's where I'm going. That's what I'm going to learn. That's what I'm going to do." Legend, though. Yeah, I mean, think about. I mean, crazy. he started Yoga Bhagavad. The guy's clearly a genius. Yeah, but it's for like, sure. To make that decision to say, "Yeah, that's you know, whatever." So absurd. Yeah, no, that's a fucking. I wild love the thing. Aquabats, man. Yeah, dude, all that stuff. Yeah. It, I really think that like, it this like I we grew up on that. Like we grew up on that, and and I think that a lot of people ask us like, "Hey, why why did it go away for a little bit? Why did it go away? Why did it go away?" And and the the point that we always make is that it didn't for us like we just didn't it wasn't like something that we would would blast out of our cars but like when we were alone like when we were like at home like i when when i found out that you you were coming back in i re-listened to the hang-ups again like i remember when i had that and i brought and i remember having that on cd they just did a documentary on um video game soundtrack songs yeah. and, and Superman got voted the, the most influential video game soundtrack song of all time. It, which it was has pretty cool to be. Because it, there's, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of music in video games and it, I feel, I, I, it's not like I listen to Superman and as a songwriter I go, this makes sense. Here's the hook. Here's the sing-along right. part because it really doesn't have any of those moments. It's just sort of like a fun song that just goes but because of, I mean, Tony Hawk picked it himself. He goes, I want this. We had done Warp Tour 96 and he came, he was there, he said, I want to put one of their songs in. And he picked a song that wasn't even on our first album. It was kind of like an in-between song yeah. that we didn't even know we were going to put on a record sure. because it was such a weird song. You, and it became this game changer. You think that, like, Literally. That, you think that stuff, okay. hey, yo. You think that stuff, you think that stuff, like, still happens where people go, like, people go and they hear a band and they're like, that's what I want. I want that. Instead of, like, uh, like searching it out and putting it on, like, all these social digital platforms and waiting for people to pick it. Do you think that, like, would you, as, as, as like an NR and as like a person, would you go and see a band and be like, I, this, these guys are going to make it again? Yes. Well, yes. I, think it, I, I, think it, I think it absolutely, all the I shit mean, that just, happened back then. No, I understand, yeah, you. You know, I understand like, your question because it's an algorithm yeah. for major labels. It's an algorithm when sure. it comes to at least pop music. It totally. really is. You know, it's all about, you know, YouTube views and Spotify plays. And that's really what yeah. it is. It's an algorithm. Is that, you, is that dream still alive for bands? Absolutely. Like, is that like, 100%. Yeah, because it fucking like for me, I know that in order to like get anywhere, they're going to be like, you guys have to have this amount of plays. You have to have this amount of this, mm-hmm. this and that, this amount of this. No matter, regardless of like what, how good the fucking song is, no matter how like good the band is, how much like we put behind it, like it has to have that now. And I'm just wondering like, as a per, like, does that exist still? Does that exist? I have still? to feel, I, all I care about is if I feel something, cool. if someone That's sends good. me a song and I get that, I get that, the guy's voice makes me feel something. That's what I care about. I care about the music. I, I, I will never care about the fucking play. This doesn't matter. Dude, the doesn't math doesn't matter. matter. It doesn't matter. How, wanna, many, how many plays you got on YouTube? Fuck, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. But I don't know. We released we'll it today, see. so probably, <laughs> probably, I don't know. Three. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I really don't give a shit. I was actually talking to um, with this guy, uh, Peter Mensch. He started Q Prime with Cliff Bernstein, probably the greatest management company of all time. And I was talking to him yesterday. He's like, all that matters, he said, all that matters is the music, man. At the end of the day, just that's the only thing that matters to anybody. Dude. The other stuff is all like maybe you can you can get a moment and like recapture like the single and you know have some um, um, Gangnam style thing happen, sure. which I'm sure makes a lot of money, whatever. But that's I don't oh, know about you. That's short lived. I like... never thought. I just fucking hated. I couldn't stand my own skin. I hated everybody and everything. And music was my only escape. That was it. The only way I could Good. get out of myself. And so it was never about money. Do you find it easier or difficult with like? coming up in your time wow that makes you sound so old i am uh yeah, oldish <laughs> uh but like you know the industry's <laughs> changed and it keeps changing every like few years it's just constantly changing um from when you guys became successful and started um versus now you find yourself doing a and r and watching bands and being out there in the scene still is it difficult or easier for you to just bring these bands to labels or the labels that you work with and be like, here, this is, this, this band sounds like they got what it takes. And like, I'm really into them. They, they like 
they affect me musically. Do you see a lot of pushback internally I, I, with that, or I think or you're, have you you're been judged, able to adjust? You're, you're judged by your success. You're yeah. judged by your experience, and my track record has been amazing. Yeah, and I just I have gone hard always, and I just keep going. And you know what bums me out? Not on that question, but like when you know people say. I'm hustling. You, I, dude, you're still hustling. Like yeah. it's some fucking thing that I'm conniving someone, no, convincing you're, them. You're living and breathing. You got to sign yeah. this fucking band because just because, bro. Like, don't look over here, like the Wizard of Oz or something, dude. I'm not gonna fucking work with a band that I don't believe yeah. couldn't be the biggest band in the world, and I'm not gonna try. I'm not pitching shit. Like that word hustle is, I mean, I get it. I understand that we have to work really hard to kind of be relevant and stay important. You know, there's so much noise out there on the internet. But it's it, also, it's calming to know that people like you are still involved in the scene and, and, mu- and with like the bigger, higher up music stuff. Especially for young, like hungry bands that are just like, dude, I don't give a fuck about plays. I don't, I don't care about numbers. I don't care about social stats. Like it is good to know that that people are out there actually like putting their neck out just to have good music. What's so. the, what was like the, tr- what's the transition to pop like? Because you mean from like the used yeah. to five seconds? To yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, like what, like I wasn't really a conscious thing to be honest. Like yeah. I said earlier, it's like the idea of like, you can, you can chart your life looking backwards to see yeah. how things happen. I was, I work with the Veronica's because I did A&R for Warner brothers and, um, uh, this guy Jeff that worked for Warner Brothers, Jeff Aldridge, said, "Dude, I got this band that you should write with. They're kind of rock leaning, like kind mm-hmm. of Avril Lavigne, the Veronicas, and I don't know if you ever heard them, but that you know they're really great. There's two twin girls from Brisbane, and amazing people. I met them randomly. The Jessica dated the guitar player for Five Seconds of Summer, Michael, because they're Australian, sure. and I was in London. And I just was just whatever, just saying, how are you? We're just having a you know email conversations. Oh, I'm dating this guy that's in a band that's in London right now. I was on tour. You should go just say hi because he's a really sweet kid. And sure. so I just showed up before they were signed or anything. I just showed up at their rehearsal space and they just played me a bunch of songs and it just sounded like All Time Low and Good Charlotte and all the stuff that we, you know, we know. I just right. knew, I knew the sound. I knew what to do with them. I knew exactly. And they didn't even know who I was, to be perfectly honest. They, they didn't just, know. It just, you, it they clicked. knew All Time Low. And, and right. I was touring so much. I mean, I still have some world's record for how many shows I've played. I toured for 20 years straight, like nonstop. So I missed like kind of the beginning of Hopeless Records. I missed Vagrant Records. I missed so many because I was just on the road and I'd see bands that'd, that'd be open for us, but I just didn't know. And so all these bands that they knew, I just wasn't really familiar with or whatever. I mean, I, I knew Simple Plan, but those are the bands that they listened to. Simple right. Plan, All Time Low, Good Charlotte, right? Right. Yeah. But I knew the sound and I knew I could help them. And so I said, when you guys come to LA, let's write a song before they were signed, before they had anything. And I just met them randomly through her. It wasn't like some thing that I was going after that I'm like, I need to find some some pop band, but, but ultimately in their defense, they wouldn't have said we're a pop band sure. at the time, but because of the One Direction relationship, time, yeah. it exploded them in that and right. it became, and, and to be honest, I mean, there's nothing I like better than changing the course of totally. pop radio. Awesome. Like, I mean, like I did with the use, ultimately Bert found a Gerard from My Chemical Romance, signed My Chemical Romance, and that whole scene started, and the entire modern rock shifted because of the use, ultimately. Yeah. And now, look, we're, it's not like uh, pop radio shifted to guitars on any level. Some, someone said the other day, dude, guitars are coming back because Sean Mendez has a guitar. I'm like, <laughs> so that's rock now? Like, Sean <laughs> Mendez and Slayer is the same fucking thing? Really? Like, really? Yeah. You know, but I didn't say that. I just yeah. thought it and just said, cool. You know, but anyway. Was it an A&R that told it to you? Of course. Yeah, of course it was. <laughs> Sounds like something an A&R would say. <laughs> yeah. So you'll probably see those guys, the five seconds of summer guys on Tuesday. Great. They cruise. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they tell me they have the best times every time they go. Those guys are, they're the only dudes that I have to be like, are you 21 yet? Yeah. And like check with the venue. Like I have to, like everybody else is cool, but I have to always make sure to be like, uh, to, to let them know. Yeah. I, I met Luke when he was 16. That's how, that's when I met him. So that was, so I think he just turned 21. The singer, he's the he's the youngest. Yeah, no, uh, that's the one. Yeah, Luke, yeah. that's the one I have to get. He's twenty. Yes, is he? Yeah. Okay. I fucking know because I'm <laughs> trying to help me help, help you out, Luke. Yeah. No, I almost got. I was like, uh, every single time I have to be like, you gotta let him in there in the band, you know, you gotta do the thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Put X's on that kid's hand. No way. Uh, where are we at, Teach? We're at thirty-nine. Cool. Cool. So, I, are there any are there any projects you've worked on that have been like incredibly different than other? Others you've worked on that are just like far left. I mean, they used for sure. I mean, they are yeah, the band that changed my, you know, changed everything, you know, because ultimately, like, I, I moved to LA in the 
hair metal movement. They used to block off Sunset from, um, you know, where Holloway, um, right there where Tower Video used to be. Like, yeah, they used to block yeah. it off from yeah, there right. all the way down to... Um, it's my favorite spot Doheny. Like, there's four blocks. They'd block it off and there'd be like four, three, four thousand metalheads just like you could fucking smell the Aquanet from like miles. Yeah. The, the air was so <laughs> rad. It was incredible. I moved here in 87, so that was the movement. I watched... I met Maynard from Tool the day he got off the plane and you know, he became, I was in a band called the Electric Love Hogs, like a sort of like fun, I don't know, like a fishbone Metallica kind of thing. And, and he was our mascot and Maynard, Maynard would come dressed in a chef's hat and he'd have a um, lawn blower with uh, hot dogs. He'd shoot hot dogs from a lawn blower into the crowd when we'd play. He's like our fucking mascot. That's so shit. rad. It was epic. We, I mean, I just, I just I experienced so much through my time here in L.A., but I mean, ultimately, like when I started Goldfinger, it was like I needed to get back to what I grew up on, and the Buzzcocks were, I don't know if they're my most influential kind of songwriting kind of band, because they were like a, like a fast Beatles, yeah. really great songs. Fast all, Beatles. Fast Beatles, that's yeah. what they were, exactly. <laughs> and um, you know, and because of that, like, I mean, being part of the scene where it was like Buck 09 from Phoenix, you yeah. know, we did, that was our first tour we did, yeah. Skeletones from Riverside. It was all these kind of local ska bands that we played with. And my first show ever was uh, English Beat and Bow Wow Wow, which were these kind of like 80s ska bands. And so I had all these kind of influences and I put Goldfinger together selling shoes because uh, I just wanted to play that kind of music. It wasn't like, I didn't think it was going to pay the bills on any level. I just loved fucking pop punk music and that's why we started the band. And um, I mean, ultimately, The Used came along in a, in a, in a, in a uh, probably after the third, fourth Goldfinger record, I think, where it was just like, something needed to change. Because I mean, everything at that point was kind of like, Good Charlotte was sort of the end of the run, you know, as far as, you know, Green Day and Blink yes. and my band. And No Doubt, we toured a lot with No Doubt back in the day. And then Good Charlotte was sort of the end of that, or I felt like it was, everything was pop punk. And then I found, you know, Bert came in our bus as a 17 year old kid and he's had a cassette tape. And he just like threw it at me because I, I think he was ner- whatever as a kid. He just yeah. threw it at me, <laughs> and my my uh, tour manager just picked him. He's so little, just picked him up and just fucking threw him out the door on his face. I'm like, oh, whatever. And, I'm, and I listened to it the next day, and I'm like, I've never heard anyone sound like that kid ever. And I'd heard Glassjaw, I'd heard Fi, I'd heard Poison the Well, yeah, you know. So I'd heard. But there was no Michael Jackson fucking he, choruses anywhere on any of that shit. It was, was just... Yeah, he was like one of the first dudes to like actually do the sing scream thing, but like beautifully. Yeah, and, and like I love that, that. I love that Refuse record, bro. I fucking love it. And I met Dennis and I could tell what? he was like, you're the guy. The Shape of Punk? Yeah. It's like, it, that's probably like my favorite yeah. album. And I've met him a bunch because we're animal rights shit. And he's whatever. He's a fucking legend. But I met him and I could tell he's like, you're the guy that fucking brought post hardcore to the mainstream. Like, bummed. Like, bummed that oh, I, he was, was I was the guy. Was he pissed? He was like, you was know, he whatever. Really? Like, he wanted whatever. to stay yeah. back. Yeah. I could, I could well, feel. Well, dude, you know, they did that fucking band. Uh, what was the. the Capitalism stole my virginity. Oh, uh, the, the side thing. Yeah, they did a side thing. The division yeah, yeah. of Laura Lee. No, it wasn't that. But they, they refused. The dudes from Refused did the fucking side thing, and it was like, fuck. What are they called? Do you know what I'm talking about? All I can think of is Mastercraft, but those are the guys. No, from, that's uh, Justice. Yeah, that's from DFA 1970. No, the yeah, 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 International Noise. International Noise. Yes, yes, yes. And those yes. fucking. I got- that, the other refused yeah. the band. Well, he's got a computer. No, no. Thanks, Google. <laughs> Legend. This guy was. I mean, so it was yeah. kind of like it was kind of like like I felt partly like I've I had um, you know kind of ruined someone's little secret that they had. You right. know, by but ultimately like that was never Bert's point was never to be some underground you know punk band. I mean, he was always like Michael Jackson is my favorite artist of all time, and that's who I want to be. I want to be Michael Jackson. It was always that. And he loved AFI and he loved all that. But it was like, that's what we did with it, with those records is we had these epic sing along anthem choruses with these verses that were just like, holy shit. And I remember I'd be sitting with these legends when we started showcasing them around like Leo Cohen and they would sit there and go, oh, this, you know, sing, your, your voice is amazing. If only you screamed a little less. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was just like, no, you know, fuck, that's what the yeah. whole point is. That's you know, what that's is. what it is. Yeah. Yeah. How, like, how, how do you like get that around? How do you get that point across to people that like don't like, because there are people that have to put this shit out. There are people that like have to do this stuff. They're like, we ha- they have to sign off on it. And like to convince somebody, like be like, I know that this is going to work is essentially like what I do all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a singer with a unique voice that has a point of view that actually has a vision, right? Yeah. That's imperative. I just, I can't, 
I can collaborate with someone, but I can't write their songs for them. All sure. my biggest successes have been collaborations. I have to like have co- like a like unique, co-writing? but even like the band Foxy Shazam, who never grew to be what I was hoping oh, that they would have been. Band. Band. Awesome. But it was a true collaboration. I met, er- I met Eric and I knew that there was raw, but the, the music was so chaotic. I knew it wouldn't be pal- palatable, palatable, uh, it wouldn't digestible. You probably Yes, speak digestible. I would ask Siri and she would, she would yeah. spell it for me. Yeah, um, but I knew it wouldn't, I, and so I, I kind of built a thing with them that was a real collaboration. I feel like that's part of it. I always film a video. I'll fund a video on my own, just like I, whatever. Right. Like nowadays, it's iPhones and iMovie, and you just put a video together. So the yeah. visual attached to be able to tell, like, yeah, you got these that, guys. You got musically now. You can just musically, I can do that. Yeah. I can ask hey guys, my daughter. My daughter's going to, yeah. my eight year old's going to direct the next video. <laughs> yeah. um, so I have a visual. I'll do three songs to just say, here's, you know, like, whatever. A slow song, fast song, whatever. It's like a kind of a spectrum of what it could be. And then that's, I've got a thing to kind of pitch to whoever. Do you do you find a lot of like bitterness um, pitching these things to like the olders? You mean taking I mean, a new band to like a better well, I mean, like even a music? just like the Refuse is a good example. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't call that bitterness, uh, but more so like, do you see? Oh, how do you deal with like the pushback of like new things where you're just like. Yeah, he sounds like Michael Jackson, but he's also screaming. That's fucking. But it's the same thing that we're talking about because we talk about rock and roll. Like we can talk about My Chemical Romance or The Who or whatever, like as what we call rock and roll. But it's all the same shit that your parents like got mad at you. But it's like all the guys that went to high school, the music, these everything, everything sucks. But Ed Sheeran does not fucking suck. He rules. Good. I'm glad. I'm real glad that like that. That's the. I think that's a the a really important distinguishing factor about people who are successful is that you can understand that even though well, it's, progress. it's not what you like, like I like things that aren't things that I should, should like because I can respect it and I can be like, that's something that like I, I think is really, really great. And I think that that's like a really great way that like I, for everybody to understand that like it's okay to not, it's okay to not like exactly what you're supposed to like and understand that like just because it's not what you're normally used to, it's okay. Like you like you would never ever expect you to be like, yeah, Sharon's fucking great. But guess what? He writes great songs. Like yes. fucking dude, like that's what it comes down to. At the end of the day, sometimes I listen to the radio and I'm like, oh man, I don't want to like this. I think people I also like just this. say like the word, the phrase guilty pleasure a lot less now, you know, and that's kind of, I've noticed that people, even, even with emo night and stuff like that, People are kind of embracing this weird, I don't know if it's, if it's ironic, more so like you're not as scared to just admit that you like things now. So you could straight up play yeah, Sorry Justin that. Bieber at, at, at Emo Night and, and, and people oh, dude, would just yeah. be like, yeah. wow, whatever. Yeah, people, I've literally mashed up Justin Bieber and Weezer yeah, and people like, went nuts. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's happened and yeah. that's the thing. I think that everybody, like again, right now they just want to have have like a good time and they want to be make sure that they're not alone they want to make sure that they're like this is it's dude it's because it's rough like i'll go to sleep and i'll be like i don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow yeah i don't know what the fuck's happening exactly you're exactly right and and to speak in dennis's behalf who i don't even know and i don't even know if he fucking he he could have just been swedish and been like i don't want to look at this guy he could have had no (laughs) anything whatsoever in my relation with him um but in his behalf like the idea of what emo night i think stands partly stands for is the idea that this music and the sound never really became you know what i mean like like ario speedwagon of my generation like these big they, most of the bands like yellow card never maybe got to the palladium but it was never like some th- mainstream thing and that's why people hold it so close to their hearts because it's so meant so much to them and it, not the rest of the world it's like a badge of it's like a badge of like that we held on to when we were, when we were like younger and no, we didn't really let anybody see it and now it's okay. Like, and I think it's like you're pulling that bandaid off and being like, fuck it. Like, I don't give a fuck. And I, and it's, it's important. I think rock and roll is important right now. I think new music is important right now. I think a lot of, lot of stuff that like these people that are coming here, things that you're doing, shit that we're trying to do is important because of what is happening. And I think it's like a new, it's not punk, but it's like kind of punk. Yeah, you know, it's like all, it's about as that. punk as this generation. Yeah, gonna I get. know it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to do. But I know there are bands. My friends' bands, horror. They're like, you know, they're, they're fucking punk. Yeah, they're punk. Horror yeah. is fucking punk. Yeah, they're Death different. Grips is punk. Yeah, they're punk. And Kanye's fucking punk. I agree with you a hundred percent. It just does what 
he wants to do. That's it. That's and it. He, you know, he came from fucking nothing and he built it, which is exactly what the that's dream what, is. That's, it's, right? And it's awesome. And like, you can't, you can't it. talk, you can't knock people for just being like, I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. And like, I'm going to be successful at it. And I think that that's a testament to like pop music in general is just, I mean, even just punk music is the foundation of that is like, I'm, we're going to do whatever the fuck we want. Mm-hmm. And I think for you to get older and like be bitter about it and like, not and be upset that you didn't get a chance to like tour the world and all this other stuff is like completely backwards of like what you were built on but we're also in this bubble too of like in los angeles we really because we you know we really do respect (laughs) we respect people that like succeed and actually make their dreams you know to a certain extent like i i do at least i go no matter what you are what genre you are you've made it in music like that's a it's not takes work but when I talk to my high school bros that are in like, you know, Saratoga where I grew up in nearly this little suburb, it's good, dude, Justin Bieber's so lame or whatever, you know? And it's like, <laughs> yeah, but it, the songs are great. And right. like, he, he came from fucking nothing. Like, I, I, I like the backstory. I like to know how, like the Skrillex, like I've known forever. And, you know, they may say, my high school friends, there's no guitars or there's no words, but I go, dude, listen to the sounds, brother. Like nobody does what that That's, guy does. I nobody. Know. Nobody. He's a genius, a fucking genius. He really is. And like, like he's got to be an alien, right? Because like who else just like happens to come upon this whole new genre of music kind of out of nowhere. Like I was, I was singing a hardcore band and two years later, I have a, I opened a laptop and started a movement. I know you had from first to last play at your, uh, your, um, at Emo Night and uh, he came over to, he had Travis record drums in my studio, I guess uh, probably two nights before they played at your place and it was just like, and his energy's always been the same ever since I've known him, no matter what. It was like three in the morning he came over, which is way past my bedtime. Oh, yeah. But he's like, dude, I'm going to come over. I want to record Travis. Travis is always awake. So we're like, let's go. And he came <laughs> over. And every, he played us like eight songs, like a verse in the course of eight songs he was working on all over the place. Uh-huh. And every song, I was just sitting on the couch. I was so tired, man. I knew how to get up for two hours for my kids. <laughs> yeah. And he would just look at me, and he was dancing <laughs> every song like yeah. at me, yeah. like the whole time. <laughs> But not like in the best, yeah, it was just no, in the like, best, he's like, he's a most positive. Yeah, he's just he was about so shit. excited, yeah. like, check this out. Wait, wait, hang on. And play me something else. Like a two year, like a five year old, like super pumped about yeah, like, dude, a new toy. I, that's, yeah, dude, that's, you know, so you know that's a dude that likes music. Yeah. I think right that's there, my biggest. I think right and at there, the same time that night in, in LA, there was someone coked out of their mind playing their music at a party doing the same sure. thing yes <laughs> doing the same thing check Sniffing this fucking part out like, dude, I- like rewinding <laughs> fucking the song yeah. uh is there anything else that we want to talk about like production wise what are you excited about going on because like i have to i have to pee so bad. <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna pee or else i'm not gonna minutes, let's just wrap it you want no I, I mean like i want you to make sure that everybody's like what do you so- think's coming next um, I, I do think that there's some hybrid of organic. I mean, I really think Flume is is, is kind of pushing the envelope That's right. of, That's, of, yeah, like of that. electronic dance. I just think that the way he does this double side chain thing, where it's like he goes the sixteenth note of the side chain, which is really, I mean, interesting. As a, just as this audiophile, I just I find it really interesting. Plus, he's the per, he's the first EDM person that I've heard where nothing's on the grid. Like everything is felt. It's all real feeling stuff. And like him and like this dude Cashmere Cat and this dude. Um, uh, uh, fucking what's uh, a fly fly bear? Like there's all these dudes that are doing this like new kind of like super and future based stuff. And yeah. it's it, it's the first time I've ever heard EDM music and been like that's so fucking. I listen. Rad. I heard, just listen to the um, hanging with Pete Wentz today just because I can just drop a name and just be like I'm chill. Fucking cool or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I let listen to his song today. And um, have you heard it yet? Pete no. Wentz's song, the new Fall Out Boy no, song. I no. Heard. Um, I think they dropped it yesterday, but it's um, it's cool. I mean, it's definitely like the the it, it feels like Fall Out Boy, but the, there's not really a chorus. It's mm-hmm. like kind of cut up vocal with this really big drum thing, and then a chilled out, you know, whatever. It feels sure. like music nowadays. Um, but I, you know, I work so much on my own shit. It's hard for me to say, like, because I feel like I've got this project called The Fever, which I think is. It's death grips like, but it's probably more rage against the machine leaning, and it's just all political, Hell and yeah. it's just like all you know. We need a change, and we're you know we have the lead songs. We're coming in, motherfuckers, just about the world that like America was built on the idea that we're a nation of you know we we will take your sick and your wandering. We will you know that's what we are, and that's what the song is, and it's basically fuck Trump, and it, that's what it says basically, and that's what I want to do. I want to say Good. what we mean, mean what we say. 
Good. And cool. say it mean. Great. <laughs> to that guy. At least. All right. <laughs> I think on that. Yeah. I think on that note, uh, we can all say that we're really, really uh, grateful and and really, really happy. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much. man. Yeah. It means a lot to us. And like all the shit that you did for music for us, I think it, it's. Every time we sit down with somebody, I got to do something for Hans Zimmer the other week, and I got to say that too. So I'm being put in this position where I get to thank the people that uh, really mean a lot to me and really like. Hans I, Zimmer I, signed Goldfinger, by the way. Yeah. Next time you see him, he did. Yeah, he's. The, everybody like made Sign me. Sign my like, band. Yeah. No way. <laughs> Next time you see him, be like Goldfinger. Everybody, you know, he. That everybody was so like funny. telling me that. He, he ran Mojo, like, right? Yeah, he's a legend. Yeah, yeah, everybody was telling me, they're like, you gotta watch out, you gotta watch out. And then when I met him, he was the fucking coolest dude in the entire world because he's just a punk. Did you see Hans Zimmer while you were working on your record? Or your first every day. Record? I hung out with him every day. Every yeah. day I go in just because we made it at his studio. Sure. Every day. I'd, he'd What's be... the craziest thing you've ever seen him do? Well, <laughs> <laughs> he got divorced. I think just the first album he got divorced twice because he's such a workaholic. I mean, that's he had, he had his dog and he had this room of synths. It was just like, I would say 50,000 cables. Just like I, you couldn't even see the gear because the cables were plugged in all these like old vintage synthesizers yeah. and it was just like he would sit in that room like Captain Kirk and it was just literally what it looked like it looked like the Enterprise yeah. I'd be like dude what does that do he's like I don't know did you, yeah. I, I, wait, no, did I, you yeah. actually ask because I, I interviewed him and I was like I closed my eyes and I pointed to something and I was like what is that I was like uh -huh. you don't know what all this shit does I was like there's no fucking way yeah, you yeah. know what every single button and every single thing does and he goes ask me and then he did, and he was like, "No, these." Are, and then uh -huh. He yeah. fucking knew every single fucking thing. I was yeah. like, "All right, guys, he's not lying. We can do this." Yeah, yeah. So. He's, a, he's a fucking genius. Well, that's rad. I I would never have thought that Hans Zimmer signed Goldfinger. Yes, <laughs> Mojo sick. Records was uh, co-owned by Hans Zimmer. Um, I'll see if I can get El Diablo's number for you. Have him yes, come on thank the show. You. Great. <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll see yes. you on Tuesday. I will be there. Cool. Dude, that's the so rad. That's a lot. Again, thank you so much, and. Uh, Fuck Thanks, yeah. man. All right, now really I'm gonna appreciate pay. It. We're going to do you that. Guys, yeah, that do this stuff. stuff. All right. You are now listening to the Ride or Cry podcast.